Hello, quality people. I'm Jeff Vieira. I'm Norm Howe, and this is The Fearless Workplace. Jeff, our guest this week is a real live rocket scientist. Bud Thomas is an aerospace engineer who spent the early part of his career as an engine designer for the Apollo, the Saturn, and space shuttle programs. He then migrated to jet engine design for General Electric, where he retired as chief aerodynamicist. Wow, I got that out. Uh, total career span was over 50 years. And while at GE, he taught engine design courses and technical problem solving related to jet engine design and test. He also co-authored a text on jet engine aerothermodynamic design and recently completed the writing of a book on developing critical thinking skills for the aerothermodynamic design and analysis of jet engines. Now, Jeff, you can rest easy here because there's not going to be any test on aerothermodynamic design at the end of this. Uh, we're going to be talking about the role of technical excellence in creating a fearless workplace or reducing uh, fear in the workplace. So, Bud, what, what is the role uh, of the technical expert in, in reducing fear in the workplace? First of all, I kind of want to, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, I look at fear in my particular workplace, the aerospace workplace, Really, I put it into three different categories. I look at the more classical ones where you have people who are, are young in the business and up against more experienced and maybe even domineering uh, managers. Uh, we have the people that are just afraid of the uh, layoffs. We, we have a very cyclic uh, nature in the aerospace business. About every 10 years, there's a fairly massive layoffs. So protecting yourself against that is very important. And then the last is a fear that you might make a mistake that's going to result in the death of one or many people uh, just because of, you know, maybe your inadequacy or hopefully not. You just didn't care when you were doing the design and it, and it was just carelessness. But that's something that you never want to have to live with that you cause the death of another person. So I'd like to kind of, in this session, talk about each one of those and share my experiences as we go through this conversation. Yeah, Bud, so what, what do you do in, in the boom-bust cycle of, of the aerospace industry? What, what does a technical expert do? to insulate themselves? Well, I think, in my opinion, the best strategy is that you get the workplace to have respect for you as an engineer. You, you have to have the ability to come up with good designs that are based on facts and good physics, but also the humility to show that if you make a mistake or if something isn't quite right, that, um, okay, you can admit it, and then upper management sees that they're not being misled by somebody down the wrong path, where they're going to spend time and money on a design that doesn't work. So having respect and developing that respect is, I think, important in uh, maintaining your job. Now, I did want to kind of mention I had, in my early days, and I had a lot of early day good experiences, um, I, when I first got graduated from the university, I went to work on the Apollo program. And my mentor was one of the German rocket scientists that came from Germany, worked under Von Braun on the V2 project. And I learned from him that, being, that discipline was very important. You have to just stick with the process. You have to pay a lot of attention to detail and you continue learning throughout the whole career. He studied for one hour every night from the time that he graduated until that, the time that he was my mentor. He just studied basic math and physics, looking at it from every which way you could to where you had a very, very strong foundation. 
So you could then, you know, use that during your design process and your test process. But you have to be disciplined and it's tough and you got to hang in there and and just stick to it throughout your whole career. Now, Bud, uh, you're working regularly with people who literally sit on top of explosions. Are you telling me that one of their biggest fears is just the change that you go through when the program reaches the end and that you might be unemployed for a couple of weeks? Uh, that, you know, in all honesty, the reason I left the space program because the design process ended and it was getting into the where people now we were using the product. So me being an engine designer, OK, that was history now. And we were transitioning into the uh, new uh, phase of the Saturn Apollo program. So I had to find a new job. But in all honesty, back in the uh, 60s, uh, you get there were lots of jobs available. I, I kind of had my little thing, see the USA on a resume, because uh, there were so many jobs available. So it wasn't necessarily uh, fearful as it was an adventure. So, so but, t- nowadays it's different. But how do, how do you get engineers who are coming off the high of a big success in a program and now they got to start thinking about the next thing. How do you get them to see it as a venture? What was what was your trick to to do that to keep people focused on the future and uh, the opportunities that were represented by that? Well, I have to admit the highs in the space program were astronomical. I'll put it that way. It was extremely exciting, um, but everybody has their own DNA. I'm I like adventure. So going to something else, for me anyway, was, was okay. It was just another step in life that offered opportunities. And it's going to give me the opportunity to learn more things and to do hopefully more exciting things. So for me, it was always exciting. Uh, for other people, I have to admit, it's fearful. They don't know where they're going to land. I didn't really care where I landed because I always figured I'd work it out. I'd make it work. So, and I think a lot of aerospace engineers are of that caliber. I, I can imagine when you're thinking about the people that are on that rocket, that has to have a, a pretty big impact on, on how you design it. Uh, I mean, I heard an astronaut talking one time, they were interviewing him, and they said, uh, well, w- were you afraid? And he said, well, you know, we had so many things to do. And when we're going through the countdown, there was so much to do. I really didn't start having fear until I realized everybody else was climbing down. I was the only one in there and everybody else was clearing out two miles away. That's when I started to feel fear. And I imagine that's got to be a lot of stress on, on the designers. It is. When, when I was in the space program, it was under the direction of Von Braun and his team. And I have to admit, I, I was fortunate. I got to know most of them. I lived with them. I worked with them. And I had a lot of respect for them. And I worried when they started retiring and it was going to go from that, uh, those people to the other just regular American trained engineers, uh, that there was going to be some potential problems. Now, I can't say that there that any any problems that we did witness after that were because of that, but I just fear that the discipline uh, and the flight safety being number one was going to slip. Now, we, we did see in the space shuttle uh, with the Challenger accident, with the O-ring on the boosters, was a kind of was in that neighborhood of a problem because we had the chief engineer at Thiokol looking at the data for the day of that launch saying this is not going this is outside of our our region of expertise we do we have not tested there I recommend we don't launch today because the temperature was below where they had experience now the management was more focused on on number of launches per year 
they, they had a time frame and there were some private meetings and some decisions were made and communicated to NASA that it was okay to the, to the launch director. But see, that was the type of thing that I, I personally don't think would have happened under Von Braun. It, it would have waited. Flight safety was number one when I worked there. But didn't that also come up again with Columbia in that prior to the Columbia launch, we'd, we'd had some knowledge of uh, what happened when you, when you uh, had things strike the uh, leading edge upon takeoff, right? Now, we didn't have full knowledge, and, and it was, as I understand it, it was pretty eye-opening when they actually did the test on the ground and realized the force that was involved. Uh, but we did have some indications because we'd had previous launches where there was some significant damage done to the orbiter uh, upon takeoff. Uh, did we not learn the lessons from the Challenger disaster? Were the same drivers in play for Columbia, do you think? Or was it, was it a different cause? Well, for Columbia, there were some, uh, there were some improvements implemented after Challenger, first of all, we did, after Challenger, we, we scrubbed all the launches for about a year or two. I forget the exact time frame. And NASA went back to the drawing board and went back to school to see, you know, uh, what happened? Why did it happen? What do we need to do? They implemented uh, one of the things they did. They brought the astronauts into the decision making process. Because, I mean, in my mind, that was kind of important because they're the ones that are going to be uh, at the end of you know, right it on that rocket. And they needed to be comfortable that everything the civilian personnel were doing made sense and their safety was not at risk. They also implemented some other things along the process, but challengers, I mean, um, Columbia still happened. So there were still gaps in the process and there were still management pressures and program pressures. So unfortunately we had then the, um, the, the tile problem on Columbia. Bud, how does a, how does the technical expert stand up in the room when you've got somebody there who's sitting on top of a huge uh, pile of organization chart I. Uh, that you know uh, is used to calling the shots. How, how does the technical expert stand up to that? The technical expert has the responsibility to, in, even though the, it's pretty extreme adversity, and they have still the the moral and the ethical responsibility, if there is a life at stake, to do everything in their power to explain why the, they are making their decision, whatever direction that is. Now, they, that presents a, a major dilemma, say, for the chief engineer, because the person at the top of that organization chart is going to make the final decision. And there can be some rather, uh, some pretty, a lot of infighting at this point. The 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 uh, the person the chief engineer is faced with a a pretty difficult situation. They know that they if the if the if the senior leadership in the business decides they're going to override the chief engineer, he doesn't have many options to save his job. I mean, he can fight, lose, and maybe be fired. He can go be outside and go to the customer and say, look, here's what my management wants to do. I think this is wrong. I advise you to, to not accept this whatever uh, product. Of course, he'll probably get fired for that too. So the consequences to the chief engineer are pretty severe, but they still have the, the responsibility to, to do the right thing. And even if it's that costly. And Bud, uh, you know, the, the, during the Challenger disaster, we had a great example of the, a technical leader kind of standing up. It was after the fact, 
It was somebody who didn't have the fear of losing his job over it. But uh, Richard Feynman stood up in that room when they were going around and talking about causes. And he sensed that the Morton Thiokol reps in the room were kind of trying to push things away from the O-ring. And he simply took the sample that they sent around and put it in a glass of ice water when it came around to him. And then, of course, at the he bent it. Right? And then, of course, at the end, it came back around to him and he pulled it out and showed that it remained bent. And so an O-ring that doesn't re- you know, go back to its original shape doesn't seal very well. Uh, <laughs> and, and pointed out, you know, with, with characteristic understatement that this seemed like it might be of interest to the problem. Right. But Feynman, as brilliant as he was, as great as that, you know, uh, observation was and that little experiment in the room was, uh, Feynman wasn't the guy who was going to have to explain to his family that they didn't have any money coming in anymore. Um, now, we all know that, you know, you, you still do the right thing, even though um, uh, that's the case, because you're talking about other people's lives. We lost uh, those seven astronauts you know, the impact that it had on their family, uh, families to, you know, to contend with as well. So how do you, so everyone can kind of empathize. You're in that situation. You have expert knowledge and your gut is telling you, don't do this. Um, you, you might not, you, you're not going to have perfect proof of that, right? But you, you feel in your bones that it's wrong to launch. Uh, how do you overcome that fear and do the right thing, despite the fact that you know that if you if you scrub this launch, the hell is going to come down on you. Well, I think the only, I mean, you're in a in a dilemma where there's no easy way out. Uh, you're going to. I I was fortunate. I worked for the chief engineer of the business, and his flight safety. He was a pilot also. And flight safety was number one. He understood flying. He understood engineering. He understood ethics. And he was unbendable when it came to a situation like this. Now, I can't say he didn't have fear, but he had strength. And he had the strength to do the right thing, even though he knew that the consequences for him might have been significant. So I, I don't know that he feared it. He just did what he knew was the right thing. He feared probably most of doing of not doing the right thing, violating his own principles. So for him, that was the biggest fear, that he, he could not be himself and follow through what he knew was right. So it sounds like you replace one fear with another. The fear of having to look yourself in the mirror after a tragedy versus the fear of, you know, paying a, a noble price to prevent a tragedy. It's like the, so, the soldier jumping on a grenade. He just knows what he has to do, even though he knows the consequences, you know. But that's the right thing to do at the moment. Lloyd, what one constant overall time in, in workplaces is, is the conflict between younger and older generations. I. Uh, I mean, and this goes all the way back to Aristotle. I think he made some kind of a comment about the younger generation coming up. Uh, so it, it's it's something that's happening today. It's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, so and and the older generation normally populates management ranks. The younger generation is coming in. Uh, how did that work in, in your career? Uh, it's it's a, that's reality. That's that's that was correct. Um, I think there's, there's two things. When you come out of college as a young person, you think, you know, everything you're going to come into the business and you're going to take, you're going to show them how to do it. Okay. Now at the end of my career, I knew that how wrong I was, but, uh, so, and then the older people, they do know more, but so there's always this, this built in conflict right from the get go. Okay. But, um, I think, after a while, the young engineer, let's say the five-year engineer, has, a, has at that point enough experience to stand up to uh, a more, an older, well-established engineer. And then they're, they're, at that point, they're prepared that they can argue with them and present arguments 
that makes sense. That, that's the one thing you have to do is say, I, what I'm telling you is based on, on good solid physics. Uh, we have experimental data and I'm convinced that I'm right. And this is why I'm right. Okay. Now, uh, I'll share my story about the, uh, the supersonic turbine, if you would. That's where I was put up against, um, you know, the, the president and the staff and his staff for all of GE aircraft engines. And um, I was definitely um, intimidated because I was a young engineer um, and they were all f seasoned engineers. But the only thing I had in my hip pocket was I was the only one that absolutely knew what I was doing because I was the only one doing it. And I was designing the world's first supersonic turbine to go in a jet engine. That was so, my knowledge level was even higher than my boss's. He was the one invited to the meeting, but he realized he couldn't handle the questions. So I was requested to go. So I get down into the staff meeting and I walk in. Now, first of all, this was the seventies. It was Vietnam. I had joined the hippie movement. I go into this meeting in blue jeans, a flowered shirt, a beard and long hair. And, um, I'm meeting with a staff that's in three piece suits, well polished. You know, they actually had shoes on that were polished and uh, coats and ties and vests. And, and I snuck into as, as far <laughs> into the background as much as possible because I obviously didn't fit. But then it came time to talk about this turbine. And the president of the, of the business brought it up and he asked for my opinion. So I gave him my opinion and he asked his staff, well, what do you think? And they looked over at me and they went from the floor up to my head and back down to the floor, looking at how I looked, not by what I said, but how I looked. And they told him, we don't trust him. And the president says, well, I kind of trust him. I want to hear some more. So, um, I proceeded to explain this new turbine and how I was confident that that was the turbine to go in the new engine that we were proposing. And I went on and did my explanation and, and the president again looked at his staff and they again looked at me from, they went from my, from the floor, from what I was wearing all the way to the top and looked back at the president and said, we still don't trust him. And he said, well, I do trust him. So, and we're going to put this turbine in our new engine. This is the way we're going to go. Now that turbine has become the most popular turbine in the world. It's in over 10,000 engines now. And you can hardly get on an airplane. I'd say probably 50% of all the airplanes in the sky today have that turbine in, still today, but it's, it's, it's been modified. But anyway, um, it was just, I just had to say I was confident that I was right. I had the background, the knowledge, and I just laid it on the line how it was, and it was good enough for the president. And now it's, it, it proved itself in the air. So, but it was a struggle. It was, I was totally intimidated by those guys. So, so Bud, uh, so you've operated at some of the highest levels of your profession. Uh, and it's a profession that is just fraught with stresses and, you know, potential issues. I mean, uh, you talk about safety being the, the job one, but, you know, when you're sitting on top of explosions, the way these folks are, it's, it's hard to do that per with perfect safety, right? Right. Sometimes That's things correct. just happen. So how do you advise, you've had to deal with some of the extreme levels of stress in your career. How do you advise that people on the front lines of some of those very high risk professions, how do you, how do you recommend they deal with that ever present fear? I always start that we're talking about getting rid of fear. I start with fear. I, I have taught over two or 3000 young engineers at GE 
I get all the new ones coming out of college. The very first lecture, I, I take fear, I drive fear into them to, to recognize that you work for GE now. We're not making light bulbs and refrigerators. I said, if you make a mistake, somebody can die. And then I go in and I, and we talk about, I, I share stories with them of, you know, we talk ab about the accidents that have happened where GE was involved and people did die. And I try to literally scare them, you know, as much as possible. Because I want them to know and to remember that they are always responsible for what they do and death could be a result. So the way I try to, then the next thing is, okay, I've taken, I've scared them. Now this is how we're going to get through it such that you don't have to be worried. This is what you have to do now. And this is what we do as a business in order to reduce that fear. Now, the fear, the apps, we never have an engine that's 100% perfect. We can't do that. But the FAA requires that all the major parts of the engine will not fail. Well, the failure rate will be one out of a billion events, a billion. So it's not zero, but it's one out of a billion. And we go through all the testing. You know, we, we familiarize them with all the testing that's required by the FAA to prove, you know, we do lightning strikes. We do, we throw birds in the engine. We throw ice in the engine. We try to simulate every failure the airplane's going to experience and show them now your design has to get through all this. They're pretty graphic uh, videos that they see that the engine has to endure. So they now they have to learn. You have to have the confidence and the design quality that you're going to pass this test because you the one thing you don't want to do is blow up a $10 million engine on the test stand because your your design failed. So it's a little bit of using fear to get rid of fear, you know, it, but it's, it works. And I'm pretty, I feel very good that uh, over the years that I worked there, uh, there was a lot of success and very few failures. So they, they build redundancy in, into, these, into these planes and in, into the, the uh, uh, rockets. Yes, right. Uh, but but with the uh, uh, recent Boeing 737, uh, it uh, appeared that the redundancy actually contributed to the problem with those two pedo tubes. Well, it was a lack of redundancy. Typically, you would have two of them, and Boeing elected to only have one. Now, why they did that, I have no idea, because it doesn't make any sense. But they only had one. That one failed. Then the software took the failed input and we saw the consequences. Okay. So there was that. And just in Boeing's case, again, it was business driven. They were trying to reduce the cost of their new airplane because they were competing with Airbus. And, and the way they were going to reduce the cost was, okay, the airline, you can buy our engine, but we're going to save you some money because you don't have to pay for all the training on this new Boeing 737, because we're going to make it look so much like your existing one. So your pilots can get in the cockpit and they're pretty, they'll be off and running, you know. So, um, well, it, we, we saw the aftermath. It didn't work out. You know, the pilots didn't have the training they needed. And the, the 737 MAX had been flying. They had already had thousands of hours on it, but it just got to the point where we got some inexperienced pilots or pilots that experienced the problem and didn't know what to do. Other pilots knew what to do, but it was, you know, they took a shortcut and they lost big time for doing that. But that was management trying to save money to compete with Airbus. Uh, but it sounds a little bit like, too, like uh, you didn't have anyone thinking about the whole system how it was designed to operate, why it was important to have two sets of reading uh, on your airspeed from your pedos. Um, I wonder, as we see in the broader industry, the march towards more automation, 
if we're not going to find some of those similar issues because we wind up kind of auto automating a sub-optimized part of it. And, you know, if you remove too many people from the equation, uh, you might not even catch uh, until it's too late uh, the problems that have been introduced by having just a faulty assumption uh, around a level of automation uh, and what's coming out of it. Uh, you think even about this in data science where uh, if you don't have anyone with domain knowledge looking at the output of these things, then whatever numbers are spit out can be taken as gospel by people who don't know any better. And that can lead to catastrophes in the business down the line. Uh, so as, as you look at the broader context of it, uh, it, are there any areas where we're not afraid enough of the way things are developing? Uh, there are, um, and you bring up a really good point. Uh, and the, when I was a young engineer, we didn't have computers. We had to work a problem with a slide rule from beginning to end, maybe even in the Apollo program, a lot of my design work was still with a slide rule. You know, we had big chunky calculators that crunch numbers mechanically. There were a few computers, but they were reserved for the really advanced stuff which is uh, your phone could probably do in a second right now. But anyway, that's, that's the way it was. So by having to work the problem step by step, we understood when we got to the end, if it was right or not, if it, or if it was probably right or not. Over the years now that computers and, and, and the whole new generation of engineers have come in, uh, they are removed from that process. They get a problem. I see one thing, they don't think about it. They don't think about, well, what do I expect to be the right answer at the end? Um, the businesses have reduced the amount of mentoring. So young engineers don't get an opportunity to, to really find out, well, what's a good, good number? You know, if, if I was to say the load on a blade was 31,200, a, a new student would know, is that, what does that mean? I, you know, is that the right order of magnitude? It's just a number to them. So when it gets comes out of the computer, that's all they see is a number. And they have no f real good feel for, is it even in the ballpark? And sometimes they don't even know, if, should it go up or should it go down? So what happens, and, and we had it almost every day near the end of my career, that young engineers were coming to reviews with the wrong answer. And then you could ask them, well, well, what do you do to get the right answer? And they said, well, I use this program and everybody in the world uses it. It must be right. And management would say, well, it doesn't make sense. And it's what, well, how do you fix it? Well, I don't, I don't know. That would be, they, they did not have a clue how to really solve a real engineering problem. They just knew that I get something, I put it in a computer, and I trust it's right, and I report it to management. And so there's there's a lot of things felt have fallen through the cracks as far as paying attention to detail. And part of that is management saying we don't need as many people as we had before. Um, we will slim things down some, and that will make the, the stock price go up. You know they. Wall Street likes low employment numbers. So, um, but that always bothered me in my position that I can't get the quality and the confidence that I used to have. So, and I can't blame the young people. It's really the way the businesses have evolved. But the, there seems to be a lot more job hopping happening right now than there has been in the past. How does that impact team formation uh, and uh, uh, knowledge and ownership generation? I, I mean, there was a time when people would come in, they would retire from the same company. There seemed to be loyalty going both ways. I don't see that loyalty in either way today. Well, yeah. Well, at GE, one time, I think it was around 19, late 80s, Jack Welsh told all of us, he said, don't be loyal to the company because I'm not going to be loyal to you. 
Now, that was a shocking thing for the head of the corporation to tell you. And so we kind of saw the handwriters on the wall that you were, may not be here long. And, and it turned out. Now, as far as the problem, though, you, as far as longevity on a certain product line or a certain business, it's true, Norm, that um, an engineer that's been there, they'll always use, that's a resource, history. What they remember is history. And that reinforces their confidence. They, they, they can understand what's right and what's wrong or what's good and what's bad with a design. Because they can remember, back, oh, yeah, I remember back in 1979, we tried this and uh, this is what we learned from it. Nowadays, a guy will say, well, well, we weren't here in 2015, so we're not really sure what happened. You know, th- those guys are all gone. They're somewhere else now, you know, and, and that's a real problem because th- th- that's a resource that leaves the company, that knowledge base. And so the young engineers, they, they cannot have the advantage of the history of the product and, and just the little subtleties that happen during the design. So that's a big problem. And I'm glad you brought it up because, um, and in all honesty, that creates a fear to me that the younger engineers or the people doing the designs, they don't have access to that knowledge anymore. And there's a probability that something's going to fall through the cracks. And not probably, I say, does fall through the cracks. Now, Bud, you know, you were building some of the most impressive machines mankind has made, doing incredible things, uh, involving teams of some of the best engineers that have ever been produced. Uh, There's a perception out there today the what we should be doing to inspire that kind of innovation and creativity is putting basketball hoops in, bean bags, uh, you know, maybe a patch of grass in the work area. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your typical work area was like back when you were doing all these outstanding things? Okay, and it, it, it did change over the years, I have to admit, but we never had uh, all the, the nice amenities, the resort style. Uh, corporate workplace that, that I see today or I, I read about. But in the very beginning days where we worked was a large room filled with engineers that uh, seemed like chaos, but we were able to talk to one another. We were able to bounce things off of one another. It was more like a collegiate uh, atmosphere, we could say. And you could hear the person, okay, I was doing an aero design. The guy next to me might have been doing a heat transfer design, but we had to eventually work together. So I kind of heard his problems. He heard mine and we could interface eventually. And we both got smarter because we both heard each other and we could chat with one another. Um, Then we went from that large room to cubicles. Now we're in little bitty, little bitty rooms and we're, we're isolated from other people. Now we start losing this knowledge that was around us before. Okay. Now, um, and then it got to be where the next big step was 24 seven. Yeah. Oh, oh, now you can have a, you can be connected and we can get in touch with you 24 seven. I personally, when I first learned that I told them they were crazy. I didn't want any part of it because when I worked, For me, what made me a good engineer, I had a good life outside the company. I didn't need 24-7. I needed to be outside. I had to have my brain refreshed every night so I could go back in the next day and and not be exhausted and uh, be refreshed and ready to be creative again. Um, And so I'm not, I, I think those workplaces are interesting, but I don't think you need that, to tell you the truth. At GE, when I got a tough problem, I'd go out for a walk. I'd just think about it. I didn't need a, a parks-like setting or a music room or something. If you're really concentrating on solving a problem, uh, you can stay focused in the moment and just be away from all the fray of other things. So that's my personal opinion, but uh, and, and I, I don't believe in 24-7. I believe in a healthy mind it has to have some relaxation. I, I think that things. if you add it up, uh, uh, somebody ought to do a survey of all the brilliant ideas that came about when somebody was taking a walk. 
I, I, I know that Einstein came up with the theory of relativity when he was out for a walk. <laughs> uh, so go ahead. I, I actually, I mentored a young engineer at GE and he actually, after, we talked about a lot about, he had a whiteboard in his shower because <laughs> he got his best ideas in the shower that he could write it down while he was in the shower. Now, I never went that far, but, you know, we get ideas while shaving, while showering, while removed from the all the chaos around the office place. You just got to get away and think. I noticed one thing that uh, in, in my career, there were certain people that uh, I just had a rapport with somehow. And it was interesting because uh, they were not necessarily the type of people that I would want to go and have a beer with. Uh, one one guy in particular that I remember was uh, just didn't really think he was a very nice person to be around. But boy, was it amazing when he and I would get together around a whiteboard. Uh, glad you reminded me of that. And I remember so many times we would just like, and he was in one profession, I was in another, and we would just start bouncing things off of each other, and we would disappear into a zone. And at the yeah. end, there would be something on that whiteboard. Who knew where it came from? But it was a good idea. And that kind of interaction, you just can't replace that. Yeah, I agree, Norm. That's correct. Bud, uh, you talked a little bit earlier, and uh, uh, Norm talked about in your bio on there, but uh, I, I got to confess that, you know, you've triggered some trauma in me. Uh, I graduated from the Air Force Academy, and uh, I had to take aeronautical engineering and astronautical engineering, and of course, I had to take thermodynamics. So how do you get particularly young people over the fear of thermo? Because that is the one aspect of engineering. We, we, it was kind of used to weed people out because thermal, of course, thanks to the second law of thermodynamics, that wonderful law of entropy, uh, you have to deal with equations which don't really balance, right? Exactly. How, yes, how, how exactly. do you get people over their fear of thermo so they can continue on and become engineers? Well, here's what happened. I did not have a fear of thermal. I had a fear of electrical engineering. I am not an electrical engineer because I, I just had a hard time with that. I feared it. I love thermodynamics. And the reason I loved it, because I did okay in it. I did well in it. So, okay, that was easy. I think I'll do that. You know, electrical engineering, that was terrible. I'm never going to do that. So the, the fear of that kept me from uh, going in that direction. Now, the thing I like about Thermo is that Thermo was really your, your entree into systems thinking, right? Because the, the scope and the scale, what you're doing, even on small thermal problems, you're thinking about the entire system, the inputs and the outputs and all the complexities associated with that. Um, although it is kind of scary, but uh, especially when you're, you're first taking it, you really don't have a good feel for uh, what you were talking about earlier, the gut feel of what should the answer be? The approximation of, you know, about the best you could do is, should it be hotter? Should it be colder? <laughs> should it be, should the pressure be higher? Uh, so uh, it, it, it's fascinating for that reason. How do you inspire people? You know, we live in a world today where, as you said, um, it's more difficult to get people attracted to the foundations of math and engineering. Uh what can we do today to help inspire more engineers uh, to really not short themselves on that foundation? Well, I, I have my approach. Everybody has their own approach. My approach was I threw out equations to start with or, or minimized. It. I didn't throw them out, but I really minimized the necessity for an equation because my concept, my philosophy was a good engineer does not need an equation to solve a problem. A good engineer understands a problem well enough to develop the equations. So that's my starting point. So I always take the engineer and I try to make it fun. I try to make it entertaining and a, a good experience. So I take them out of the world of mathematics and I put them into the world of physics. 
of molecules and what's really going on. Somebody will say, well, pressure, aerodynamics is pressure. And I said, well, what is pressure? Well, it's this. Well, what is that? I go all the way down to, well, it's the molecules that are causing that. So they're really looking at it and say, okay, now if I, if I want to make this work better, I got to go back and take care of the molecules. I got to get the molecules to do this. And then the result will be what I want. So, uh, I always get away from equations because I hated it. I told them never answer an equ- a question because it got not bigger because the denominator got smaller. Right. So you're taking an abstract problem and solution and you're making it more concrete. Does that help uh, even people who may have a fear of math or a fear of a technical uh, solution to something? Does that help them get on board with it? You find? Well, it- you know, I hope so. I guess all I can say what really happens to individuals, but I do try to take away the abstract part of mathematics and try to get to what's really happening um, at the basic level. Well, I, 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 uh, I noticed one thing. Uh, you're, you're an engineer, obviously uh, excellent technically, uh, but you also have the ability to articulate what you're thinking extremely well. What does somebody who may have the technical skill that you have, but is not particularly articulate, how do you, how does, what do you do with somebody like that? Or, you know, with somebody who, who feels really uncomfortable explaining the great ideas that they have, what, what, what do you say to somebody like that to, to help them to get that idea out and, and on the table? I think, Norm, the, the way that I would approach that is I would sit down in a casual environment and start sketching. You know, what are you thinking about? Let's just make a drawing and this, let's look at this. Drawing a, Now, you know, in engineering, we talk about free body diagrams and things like that. But let's just put something very basic on the paper and just look at it and then take it from there and make that sketch grow until you get to the, the final product that's even more complex. But I'd start with the most basic line sketch of what they're what they're trying to uh, describe to me and just take it one step at a time. And they'd be surprised at how elaborate they got by the end of it and how well more they understood it, too. And then so and, and, you're saying that would help them to be able to explain it to others. Right. They have to see that this all has to follow in some logical sequence. You know, a lot of times engineers uh, forget that people don't know all the individual steps and, and it gets confusing because they just jump in here and there at random and they don't have an organized string of, of comments that makes sense as it evolves from the beginning to the end. It's like a computer program. You, you have to have every step depends on the one in front of it. And so the conversation has to be the same way. So, Boy, bud, uh, final question for you. Um, so obviously you're, you've spent your life in an area under some really demanding stresses where precision is an absolute must. Uh, how do you avoid, and how do you advise engineers avoid the tendency towards perfectionism, not being willing, you know, being so invested in the fear of being wrong that it keeps us from taking the opportunity to be right? Well, that's, that is a really good question because a lot of engineers have to deal with that. Um, and they are the type of engineer that never really gets it done. They're, they're just, they uh, are a drag to the overall process because they can't seem to f- find the finish line. And the only th- way that you can really do that, I don't even know if you can change those people. That's just who those people are. OK, but the people that that are able to look at it and say, OK, I, I, it, it meets all the basic physics. You know, I've done everything I know how to do. Uh, this is just the I, I'm comfortable now that I can stop. And the other people are, are just never comfortable. 
and unfortunately they don't do well. I mean, they don't progress. And that's where the second law of thermodynamics can be your friend is you recognize that entropy happens. There's no such thing as the perfect right answer. And we just have to learn to accept it. Uh, if we're going to, if we're going to do anything in this world. Right. Uh, but thank you so much for your time today and for your insight, uh, into how to really thrive in some fear-driven environments. Uh, folks, if you like conversations with fearless people like Bud, uh, then this is the podcast for you, The Fearless Workplace. And if you're out there and you've been on the fence about joining the American Society for Quality, the nation's premier uh, quality professional organization, please go ahead and take that plunge. Uh, when you do, be sure to sign up for the Team and Workplace Excellence uh, Forum. Uh, so that you can continue to be part of conversations like these. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Bud, thank you again. Any last thoughts for our listeners? Uh, no, I just encourage everyone to uh, to take the challenges. You know, engineering is an adventure. Look at it as a fun type thing to do and go do it. So good luck to everybody. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to participate. Thank you. 